and then we can get going once middle. So welcome to those that are just joining us now. Uh, welcome to our next Circular Economy Perth event, um, Circular Economy, a, a policy discussion. I'm just going to um, let a few more people in and we'll get started uh, in a couple of minutes. So thanks for joining us. Great. So thanks everyone. So welcome uh, to our June event, um, Circular Economy, a policy discussion. Um, hopefully our last um, virtual event um, since the COVID pandemic. So we're really excited to get back and, and hopefully meet in person for our event um, next month. Um, today, we wanted to um, take a look at, at policy and, and governance for a circular economy. And this aligns um, with the timing of the current um, Department of Water and Environment, um, Environment Regulations, um, public consultation for waste reforms for a circular economy that we're looking, that they're looking at in WA. Uh, so that's one of the things we're gonna um, talk about today. Uh, my name's Dylan Lamb from Holonic. Um, I'm a designer um, with both myself and my business partner, Andy Thompson, um, who's joining us today. And um, we, we're actively working within the Perth community to accelerate the transition towards a circular economy. Um, circular economy Perth, uh, I'll just go... Next slide here. So I just want to um, give a thanks to the Waste Authority um, who sponsor Circular Economy Perth, which is a monthly um, series of events um, that we host um, usually in the CBD each month and looking at a, a variety of different topics and engaging um, with entrepreneurs, local businesses and experts um, that are actively working towards um, transitioning Western Australia towards a circular economy. Um, and this is something that the state government's really interested and active in. Um, and something we're going to talk about today is, is it's all well and good for uh, businesses and entrepreneurs and us to be active, but what, what role does government play and what role does policy and legislation uh, play? So just a quick um, refresh, refresher or a 101 for those um, that might be new to the concept of a circular economy. So the circular economy is an, is an alternative um, to our traditional linear economy where we take, make um, and dispose of things. And we're quite good at this. In Western Australia, we have a, a resource industry um, that, that dominates our economy, but there's um, lots of great initiatives um, and a big focus on, on sustainability and the future of our economy. And in a circular economy, there are three key principles um, to design out waste and pollution, uh, to keep products and materials in use and to regenerate natural systems. Um, so we're going to talk a lot about um, probably the first two principles today. Um, around designing out waste and pollution and, and keeping um, products and materials cycling within the economy. Um, and we're joined um, by a range of um, local experts um, that I'm going to introduce um, one by one. Um, and we're going to start the sort of panel discussion today. So um, before I do, I'll just go through um, a bit of etiquette. So for our panellists, um, you're welcome just to come off mute um, throughout the discussion. Um, or just stay off um, mute um, during the discussion if you've got not too noisy background. Um, for our attendees, um, please just stay on mute. Um, the best way to ask questions is just to type them in the Zoom chat um, and towards the end of the discussion, um, we will have a fair uh, chunk of time for open Q&A. And we do encourage you to ask questions um, as we go. So even just admitting people as they're coming in. Um, just uh, if you think of a good question, just um, dump it in the chat um, and I'll have a read and then I'll ask them, them to our panellists as we go and I've got a series of questions. So to kick things off, I'd like to introduce um, our first panellist. I'm going to pick on um, Huya Adkins. Um, so Huya Adkins is an um, awesome consultant from Encycle Consulting who we've met recently um, and she's going to tell us a little bit about um, herself, about um, the role um, she's playing in creating a circular economy um, and she sort of comes from a background in the built environment. So over to you, uh, Hoya. Hi everyone, and thanks Dylan. Thanks for having me today. Um, really happy to be getting amongst the, the circular economy community and um, you know, chatting about how we can push this transition forward. 
Um, my background, I guess, is um, over 20 years in the environmental industry generally, um, environmental and planning uh, policy and legislation, um, environmental impact assessment, um, that kind of thing. Uh, I have spent quite a bit of time working in state government in a past life. I've also spent time um, in academia, um, lecturing at a number of universities in the area. Um, and I'm now moving into the operational side of things as a consultant um, with NCycle. Uh, we're a small consultancy business specialising in waste management and resource recovery. Um, so, yeah, I've been around the traps for a while, um, but certainly loving moving into this um, new slash old um, space. Let's do it this time rather than just talking about it. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm super passionate about the circular economy and loving seeing um, the transition that the world is making and really want to get down, get, get my hands dirty in terms of looking at how Perth can strongly uh, move forward into this new space. Great. Thanks. I, I guess my other sort of prompting question um, is, is, do you have any sort of comments or insights into the current state policy in WA? Um, and sort of what's your background and, and interest and expertise in policy? Obviously, it's influencing a lot of your work as a consultant. Sure, um, uh, I'm <laughs> um, I'm a bit of I'm a bit of a policy and legislation nerd. Um, I do um, print out sorry environment whole copies of legislation to read and hold in my hand and go through. Um, yeah, I for a number of years I taught a third year um, environmental policy and law unit up at Murdoch. Um, which uh, the challenge there was to turn a potentially boring topic into an incredibly awesome and interesting one. So I took on that challenge um, for a number of years. Um, I guess my opinion on, on policy uh, is yes, it's very important. Um, do we have any, do we have enough? Um, is the policy we have saying the things that we need it to say? No, it's not. Um, do we need a big kick forward in terms of circular economy policy? Absolutely. Um, does it need to come from government? Absolutely. Um, so I think there's a lot of work to be done in this space um, and we really need to support um, slash lean on and push our government to be, um, yeah, enshrining some of these important concepts in our policy and legislation. Great, it would be good to unpack some of that as we go throughout the panel. Mm -hmm. I'd like to now um, hand it over to our next panellist, uh, Mary Lynn uh, Kasu from Keto Plastics. So um, Keto Plastics is a really exciting um, startup and Mary Lynn um, has sort of good expertise um, in a very sort of topical industry. I know many people are interested and passionate in around um, plastic waste and, and plastic reprocessing. Um, so over to you, Marilyn, if you'd just like to introduce yourself, um, tell us a little bit about keto and, and your interest um, in, in policy and some of these waste reforms. Yeah. Hi, uh, everybody. So, yeah, my name is Marilyn and I'm the uh, co-founder and the director of Keto Plastics. Um, keto stands for keep it on shore and, and it's really important because we base all of our principle around, around that, basically. Um, so it's an innovative startup um, company in the plastic waste recycling, but also plastic remanufacturing um, industry. Um, we've basically, when we started this, this organization, myself and Benjamin, my, uh, my business partner, we realized that the issue that we've got at the moment in Western Australia, it's the fact that we believe the recycling industry does not talk to the remanufacturing industry and there is a huge gap. And um, we are not using, we are just not using recycled plastics um, in Australia. The manufacturers are using virgin plastic when we have the resource here, but we keep on sending it um, abroad rather than keeping it here in Australia onshore. 
Um, the, the reason why, um, so we did a fair bit of research and um, we found out that the reason why those manufacturers and, and any other um, industry really are not using recycled plastics at the moment in, in Australia, it's because, or in Western Australia at least, um, it's because we are not supplying them with the right, um, with the high quality tailored to demand, sorry, tailored to demand plastics. Um, and that's just because of a lack of expertise in, in polymers and a lack of, of facilities, of course, to do that as well. Um, so really what we aim to do with keto plastics is to really fill the gap where we can, we can address the demands of the manufacturing industry um, in Australia with uh, recycled high quality tailored to demand uh, recycled plastics. That's, that's really what we are trying to, um, to achieve. And um, by doing this, we really want also to highlight the fact that our customers will be the plastic manufacturers, but it could be any industry really that just want to participate to the plastic circular economy because, um, because they can. Uh, when we talk to, so we talked with, with manufacturers and we talk with recyclers as well. And when we talk to recyclers here, they are basically telling us, well, the issue that we have is that there is no market. We can't sell our uh, recycled plastics here in Australia. And um, the answer that we had is that there is a market, you're just not tapping into it. So if you think there isn't a market, just create that market because we are still in importing uh, virgin plastic. So it's the proof that there is a market. Let's just address and, and ask what, what's required um, to use recycled plastic really. That's what we are trying to do. Great, and, and I, I understand as well, you're also involved in some of the more sort of smaller scale community recycling projects like through the Precious Plastics Perth as well? Right, so we actually, we started with a community project called uh, Precious Plastic Perth. And, um, and really the objective was just to raise awareness and educate uh, people. And then we thought, well, that's, that's all good. Um, but we know that Behavioral changes take a, a decade, uh, quite often at least, and, and, and we have a problem right now that needs to be addressed. So we kept both initiatives. So we are still trying to, uh, to, to get this uh, community project off the ground where we really want people to be involved. Uh, it's really a community project driven by the community for the community to understand what they can do uh, as a, you know a mr anybody can uh, can try to participate to this and then we've got the industrial um project keto plastic that's really um yeah bigger scale and and more um innovative technology really great thanks Marilyn. So I'd now like to hand it over. Um, so we've we've got um, Huya as a bit of an expert in um, built environment. Marilyn um, as a startup in in the plastic space. I'd now like to hand it over to um, James Coghill from uh, Total Green Recycling, one of the um, co-founders and the recycling director. Um, so James is a bit of an expert in um, electronic waste and and the sort of, um, creating a circular economy for. So James, if you'd just like to introduce yourself, maybe tell us a little bit about um, Total Green and the story of, of running your business for over 10 years. Um, what role you believe you play in the circular economy and, and I guess um, you're also a bit of a bit of a policy nerd as well, like um, Hoya, um, and what the landscape looks like in WA and, and make it move to what you'd like to see, I guess, in the future. Yeah, cool. Well, hi everyone. I'm James, uh, director of Total Green Recycling. Bit on the hard face here. You can sort of see out in the, the plant there. Um, doing or trying to actually recover these materials to be used locally. Um, so I've been doing it for the last yeah, 12 years now. Um, and sort of just trying to overcome these technical challenges that we face uh, to actually reuse a lot of this stuff locally. As Mary Lynn said, we've done a little bit of work with Mary Lynn. There are local manufacturers, but getting material back to those local manufacturers in a form that they can use um, is technically possible, but it's uh, the commercials that is the challenge to actually work out from our perspective to make it commercially viable. It's still, hard to compete with an overseas operation with um, scale that can process the plastics and 
any material that we recover, we, we get a 92% diversion from land sale from electronics. Um, and the challenge for us, I guess, is, is getting it to an engineering grade uh, quality material that can be used in the manufacturing process. And um, that's where companies like Keto and that play a key role in actually testing and giving manufacturers the confidence to use that material um, in, their, in their process. So that's something that sort of we're working on from the cold face, um, looking at you know, how you can change procurement rules and stuff to make the actual commercial economics stack up. Um, so yeah, that's sort of what we do. Uh, we do everything from reuse right through to material recovery with a big push on actually trying to reuse devices as opposed to just putting through our shredder. It's much better environmental outcome. Um, and it's just about overcoming those, those challenges that uh, people, deter people from reusing like data destruction and, and sort of privacy of their data on their device. Um, we've done a lot of work in that space in recent years. So yeah, we're excited to sort of see where all this goes. And I feel like it's the right time to be um, in this space at the moment. So I'm really excited. We put a, put a general manager on uh, last week. So uh, I'm going to have a bit more time to look at policy and things like that. So looking forward to it. Great. Um, so just just maybe a bit of insight for the, those people um, on the call here that, that aren't familiar with e-waste recycling. So how sort of, what's your reliance on um, government policy and legislation in terms of like funding the recycling of e-waste? Um, do you want to just give us a bit of insight on how that works? Say for example, with the the national television and computer recycling scheme. Yeah, so without that government uh, sort of drive, whether it's on a federal level or a local level, because we were operating before the scheme came out, um, where councils would like local governments would actually realise, well, we can't landfill this stuff, and they were sending it to us directly. We actually charge a fee to recycle it, so it's not. Um, it's not commercially viable to do that in Australia without that fee, which is where product stewardship comes into to play. But there's a lot of issues that can come from government policies if they're not reviewed regularly to deter people from like unintended consequences. It's something that we have seen a lot of. The intent of the National Television Computer Cycling Scheme is fantastic to make um, the producers or the importers of the goods responsible for the full life cycle of the product. However, if it's not actively enforced and effectively enforced, then you can get these really perverse outcomes, which you'd, well, in some cases, you'd be better off without a scheme because it's encouraging worse behavior to um, happen uh, for economic gain. So um, the scheme was set up 10 years ago Oh, nearly 10 years ago in 2011 uh, really good intentions but um, there's been a lot of issues come out from that scheme where people are cutting corners that probably shouldn't be cut and just uh, it's not a really fair and level playing field so you're always almost incentivized to um, break the rules and lie uh, than actually do the right thing so they're the challenges that policymakers, in my mind have when they're trying to implement an artificial marketplace, um, which isn't driven just purely on economics. Um, so, yeah, in, in my view, I feel like we need to have a bit more of a supportive um, enforcement of regulations that we already have. We've already got quite a lot of reg regulations and not necessarily having more regulations is the right answer. It's just applying the existing regulations we have um, to get better outcomes. Uh, I certainly feel like we do need some more, um, some more regulations to actually uh, enact change. However, we just got to be really careful in which ones we bring in because uh, if we're not going to enforce them, we're better off without them, in my opinion. Yeah, great. I agree. Sorry, sorry. Can I jump in? Um, yeah, yeah, look, I, I, I completely agree, James. And I think, um, I think what we're really lacking in Western Australia um, is, you know, some critical direction 
from the top of the hierarchy. You know, we need this conversation to be having, to, sorry, excuse me, to be, to be happening at Premier and Cabinet um, level, um, coupled with finance. You know, I mean, what, what, what we find on a regular basis, which is partly to do with how our legislative um, uh, hierarchy is set up, um, but what we, you know, what we found in 2003 when the state sustainability strategy was released under Jeff Gallup, you know, it was a, you know, it was a great, um, a great strategy. It was released um, and supported wholeheartedly by Premier and Cabinet. Fantastic place for it. Um, with the change of government, um, the strategy and the team responsible for it got moved sideways into um, into environment. Um, you know, it's uh, it so often happens, and you know the circular economy and all of these initiatives that we're talking about are not yet another environmental initiative. We need to stop talking about it like that. This is a new economic paradigm, and so we need to be having these conversations and having you know the, an action driven from premier and cabinet who are responsible for overseeing the direction of our state. Um, I think, and then we need to be having specific sectoral based um, conversations and, and policy evolution to support each part, each sector, you know, be it food or manufacturing or, um, you know, whatever it might be, um, to actually support that transition. Um, and I certainly think in terms of the waste reform um, uh, the waste reform paper that we're looking at now, you know, it's a matter of we're tinkering around the edges rather than actually prescribing quite clearly that this is where we want to go in our state and this is how we're aiming to get there. So I think that while some of the waste reforms that are proposed in the paper are, you know, good for better waste management, possibly, we need to, you know, really, we need to be not talking about waste. We need to be talking about the value of resources, not which hole in the ground they go into and which class that that hole is now called, you know, it is now called through this new waste reform. So for me, we're kind of tinkering around the edges. Um, it's it's not new. It, it, it's what we do in our current hierarchy. But I really think to, to get traction, to get whole of government, whole you know, it's sector by sector across across the state, we really need to be engaging at that higher level. And um, certainly, this this paper is not doing that. Yeah. Thanks. Can I can I add as well? Um, I think it's a really good point because you know the the waste strategy 2030 really insists on the fact that their main objective is to to recover more resources and more value, and they've done quite a fair bit of work. Like I'm 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 quite happy that you know we've got this strategy here and we are looking at what can we do. We've done a huge amount of work. I think they've done a, a huge amount of work on trying to recover more resources but they haven't done work on recovering more value um, as long as we don't as long as we keep on sending that resources away we are not recovering the value we know in the plastic industry uh, we know for a fact that just mechanically recycling plastics just to recycle it to get it out of landfill that's that's good but that's not good enough in in the long run it's economically not viable unless you raise the value the financial value and the property of of that material um you're, you're not going to success after after a while it's the economic model of of this is is not going to work sending a low um a low grade plastic away to re-import a high grade product that that's um, yeah that's not circular economy and, and you know more about it than me about this but that's absolutely what we need to look at it's really raising the value of of and not not just the amounts that we recover yes yeah, absolutely right. we're, get, we're getting into the real, real nuts of discussion i like it i'd like to bring in andy now at this stage and and we all most of us know andy quite well um he's also from Hellonic. Um, but I'd like to um, bring you in, Andy, and I'm going to throw you a question um, and start to bring in some of the audience here. So, um, Jenny, 
Felipe says, um, how should we pitch circular economy to um, Premier and Cabinet and our top leaders to shift their mindset and priorities? And how can we get them across the line? How do we evolve our storytelling and measurement and frameworks and our economic drivers? So um, Andy's quite well renowned for bringing more of a holistic approach, um, uh, focusing on the economy part of the circular economy. So Andy, if you want to um, have a bit of a crack at, at Jenny's question there, welcome. Well, that's a bit of a bit of a question to get going with. Anyway, first first off, so um, I'm Andy Thompson from uh, Holonic. So Holonic's a circular and systemic uh, strategy and design agency based here in Perth. Um, we've been working here locally, uh, nationally, and been doing some stuff abroad with different people and basically looking to help business, government, uh, and academia sort of more move towards a more um, circular um, donut type economy in the future. Um, with regards to this, the policy um, that we've been looking at, um, you know, it pretty much does what it says it's going to do. It's about improving waste management and supporting the circular economy. But like uh, who has said, and Marilyn, for me, it doesn't go far enough whatsoever. It's very much about uh, dealing with symptoms. Um, and like people have said, and it's really encouraging to hear this stuff happening now because I'm sick and tired of hearing people uh, talk about the circular economy, not really um understand what the thinking behind it but um you know we've really got to move from just addressing symptoms to you know getting to the causes and one of the sort of phrases that sort of developed from the schools of thought behind the circular economy is we need to move away from doing less bad to doing more good and i think that's that phrase should stick with everyone um, i used it this weekend i was doing some stuff with some students in taiwan and the solutions they were coming up with, they're calling them circular type solutions, and they, they weren't. And as soon as I said that to him, it made complete sense. And it really helps, um, I think, with regards to the question that's been posed is, you know, with all, a lot of the time we're doing less bad, we've got to start to do more good. And I think um, with this uh, COVID-19 situation, I remember, I think someone on the call here posted up, the diagram of you know we're going to flatten the curve of COVID-19 and then behind it there's this tsunami of climate change and it's not just climate change everything's interconnected so that's really um you know where where I sort of come from um regarding sort of state policy um I haven't really got um uh, as much expertise as uh, Hugh and uh, as James there but what I will say is, during my sort of studies, um, I was part of the first cohort students on, on the world's first MBA. So we had people there from all across the world, and we had people who were working in policy in different places, and we interacted with people at the MacArthur Foundation, and some of them who were behind the 2015 um, CE policy in, in Europe. And basically, one of the things that came, that came out was that... Um, we're still, the way we approach policy is often the problem, yeah? We're still stuck with this sort of reductionist mindset where we break everything down and we address them in, in departments and we're moving, you know, we're in, a, we're in a world now that has become sort of interconnected, it's complex. Things um, can't be looked at in that way. They need to be, it needs more of a, a holistic systems approach where we see the interconnections of things and there needs to be cross-departmental collaboration. Um, one of the other things is feedback and unintended consequences. You're always going to have feedback and unintended consequences in something that is dynamic, that is moving, that is evolving. And policy needs to be adapt to that. You know, businesses make prototypes, they make proof of concepts, things evolve. Policy, you're not going to get right once. But because the process is so long and drawn out, it's very difficult to then go in and prove something and you start something for a long period of time. So for me, one of the key things that came through talking to the practitioners um, in that sort of circular space was we need to move from, um, from the, the way we do policy is as important as the policies that come out. Yeah. So the way I sort of frame the circular economy is really to look at the word itself. What does the word economy mean? We shouldn't have, we don't even need the, the, the word circular um, or well-being, or all these different economies that are coming out, sharing economy. If you if you look at the, you know, the history of the word and where it sort of comes from, it's talking about maintenance of the homes. So the way I frame it is looking after our homes within homes within homes. So looking after oneself, looking after one's family, 
um, their community, and there's different levels. And I think starting to think about things at different levels is really sort of important instead of it just being, you know, looking at it from an individual point of view. We're, you know, we're all interconnected. And I think that's the real thing from the circular economy is this systems thinking approach. It used to be one of the principles. It's been taken out as they sort of rebrand and market. But the systems approach, um, people, if you're not aware of any of this stuff, uh, suggest just, just search systems thinking. I'd start looking at that sort of stuff because that's really where we need to get to and it's what's required of this policy. So. Great. Thanks, Andy. Um, before we open it up more, there's a couple more questions that have come through from the audience. Um, just to keep it quite positive, and optimistic and celebrate um, the things that we are doing well in WA. Um, let's sort of talk about the positives when it comes to Western Australian policy. So what are, I'd like to pose to the panelists, what are some of the things that we have done well in, in recent years, say in the last five, 10 years? I mean, know we've brought up a little bit about, um, you know, our waste strategy to 2030, um, uh, where you touched on the sustainability strategy back in 2003. Um, what are some of the initiatives um, and the good things that we're doing in policy in WA or, or even in Australia that are helping to enable the transition to a circular economy? Um, yeah, if anyone wants to jump in. Well, I think um, um, I think we are starting to have the conversations, which is critical. And um, I know that may seem simplistic, um, but for anyone who has gone down the rabbit hole of um, circular economy, um, it can be pretty, pretty overwhelming. And I, my um, experience in talking to various people in various other states is that everyone um, who's, who's interested is, is starting where they are and taking the first step. And so, you know, in the last two years, I've started to see that. Um, so that has been a real positive for me. And, and for some people, it's, you know, it might literally be as small as, well, um, I'm now writing those words down when I'm thinking more about the work that I do and how I can connect to others around me. Very, very small step, but, you know, um, the first step in, in, in the overall paradigm shift is one of the most important, you know. Um, I mean, I am seeing some really interesting things come out at a national level. You know, I mean, um, the the China Sword Initiative um, has been uh, a great um, international kick up the bum, as it were, um, where Asia has basically turned around to us and said, hey, yeah, this thing that we have going on where you basically dump all of your um, dirty rubbish and, and other... Um, items on us yeah we're not so into that anymore so we're going to say no and that's been a great kick up the bum for australia i know there was kind of you know national panic but to actually get us to confront what it is that we export and to turn you know to be able to turn in on ourselves now and go okay we need to find a way within our own boundary to actually manage the waste or let's call it resources that we um, that we're producing, and to not send them offshore, which you know, which Marilyn has raised, you know, so well. Um, so we are seeing things happen in every state. Um, I'm I'm watching that with interest. Some states are um, starting at the sort of broad policy end. Some are just jumping into. Um, regional circular economy projects or large development projects where they're just working it out as they go on the ground, um, you know, just, just having a go and sort of throwing themselves into it. So I think um, for me, there are lots of positives out there. Um, for me, there's certain things that I really would like to see happen at all different levels. I guess if we're talking policy, I would love Western Australia to do some really solid grounded um, economic feasibility research to identify what the circular economy looks like for Western Australia. And I think having that, that bit of critical research, whether it's a CSIRO, you know, thing or, um, you know, engaging other private consultants, I think that would, that, that has the potential to be quite groundbreaking for us in terms of understanding how much benefit across the board we can get um, 
so that we can actually get on with, with, with making the transition. I think in Western Australia, we're still kind of talking broadly about the circular economy and it's possible that government don't really truly understand what the circular economy is and how to embed it. I don't blame them. Sometimes I'm, I'm awake at night thinking that same thing myself. God, how do we like do this, you know? Um, but I think having some really solid grounded research to show us the economic benefit of this transition um, could be incredibly um, groundbreaking for us. And I really, at South Australia have done it. I'd love to see Western Australia do it. Yeah, I think if I could just add to that. Um, so I think, yeah, it's being on the agenda. That's, that's obviously a big step in the right direction. And that's something that we are actually doing, which is great. We're actually talking about how we can make it better. Um, but yeah, I guess banning what you were saying there, Hoya, was banning things from export makes people look at the true cost of things. And that's something that we're starting to look at properly to say, well, there's a real cost in dealing with this. How can we stop creating massive amounts of waste to stop incurring that cost? But secondly, um, looking at those economic benefits from a holistic approach, not just looking at it per kilogram, here's what the charge is, or here's what the cost is. It's looking at it to say, well, how many jobs does it create by recycling 10,000 tonnes or treating this um, material a bit better than it would be treated if it was exported? Um, and looking at it from an economic viewpoint, it might not stack up immediately when you look at uh, like for like, well, it costs, I don't know, $500 a tonne to treat in WA, uh, but if we export it, we might get paid $100 a tonne. But how many jobs are we losing by not treating that locally? And if we can look at things a bit bigger from a governance standpoint, it's more than just you know, you don't run a country like you run a business. It's, it's completely different. And there's a big opportunity um, here in WA right now, or, or Australia, Australia wide, to actually look at how we can create new industries and new jobs and, and new innovation that helps drive our economy further than what we would be if we didn't, didn't look at it. And I think that's the exciting thing for me. Um, is looking at the future benefit of uh, what we can actually do. Because all the technical uh, know-how on actually how to treat all this stuff better than what we are actually do is there. It's just the economics that don't stack up. But it's a bit like, uh, you know, solar. Initially, they had to incentivize it. Now people are doing it without incentive. So it's sort of, you just need that spark to start the fire. And that's sort of where we're at right now. We don't have a lot of real success stories to point to. Um, there are a few, but uh, there's many more opportunities than there are um, sort of finished concepts. So, yeah, it's really exciting. And that's sort of the positive side of, of where we're at today um, from my perspective. Yeah, I agree, James. Yeah, whole, wholeheartedly agree. And I think, I think a lot of the success stories that we're seeing at the moment are in industry, you know, are with companies like yours, you know, I mean, you know, you and, and, and Keto Plastic as well, you guys, you know, are coming at this from a holistic, a holistic um, perspective. So yes, obviously you want to get paid at the end, end of the day, but your holistic drive around these principles is what you know is going to take your company forward. And essentially at, at, at a country level, um, you know, if you look at broadly at the economics of it, you know, if we continue to, um, you know, go at raw resources at the speed that we have, the economics don't stack up in terms of our, our global longevity, you know, like the, the economic basis for the way that we extract is completely ridiculous. You know, I mean, we're, we're tapping into a finite resource that's getting ever more expensive, ever more difficult to find, you know, market, market um, you know, variations and fluctuations, you know, civil war in the countries that we're trying to access those materials from. I mean, talk about an unstable economic system. I mean, this is, this is not creating something 
you know, stable for us as a globe and as a country and as Western Australia, you know, into the foreseeable future. So when you actually, when you actually look at it, as Andrew was pointing out, in terms of the health of our country and our globe going forward, we, 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 we can only come up with something new because the current economic paradigm is fundamentally flawed and it's, it's coming to an end. It's crumbling around us. So I think that if you're looking at that much larger macro scale, it starts to make a lot of sense because as a company, uh, sorry, as a country looking at risk, we are getting into in ever increasing risky territory around how we are supplying our citizens with what they need to survive at a very macro level. So I think, yes, when you're, when you're looking at, you know, um, the more micro level, you know, for Marilyn around, you know, virgin plastic or recycled plastic, we've got a lot of work to do there in terms of creating markets for recycled materials, absolutely. I think at a country level and a global level, we are seeing our economic system crumble and it's time for something new um, you know, and, and transformative to come in. So I think there's multi levels to this transition to an economic, uh, to a circular economy. Um, but we're getting into really, and have been in dangerous territory for a very long time for a whole range of reasons, be they economic, environmental, social, you name it. Um, so yeah, I, I, I wholeheartedly support, um, you know, where your comments, James, in terms of what it needs to look like going forward. And I think it is really positive. Yeah, great, thanks. Any, um, maybe just brief comments from Andy or Mary Lynn? Mary Lynn, maybe on um, positives you're seeing within the sort of circulation, yeah. topic, whether that's maybe the container deposit scheme or... or yeah, that. that's a, actually, that's a good point. That's something I, I wanted to, to raise and uh, I just didn't find the right moment. Um, we, we, are, we are starting to see really good uh, initiatives. So the container deposit scheme is one of them. Um, something that I think we are starting, and I'm very new to, to this because I wasn't in Australia 20 years ago for a start, <laughs> and I'm new to this industry as well. But um, what I believe we are starting to see more and more and we are doing well is indeed that like, we are starting to do the consultation and we are starting to connect the government, the industry and the community. There is a huge uh, push coming from the community. We need to listen to this one because uh, it, it's it's quite important <laughs> and also when we when we do connect the government the industry and the and the community we need to stop thinking of the industry as the waste management industry it's the industry in general like western australia is not driven by the waste management industry it's driven by the oil and gas the mining and all these constructions industry they have their word to say because they will be the one helping to drive you know this circular economy as well so and and that's the point that you know when when i read this um this document this consultation paper on the strategy they always talk about the industry being the waste management industry or the recycling industry nobody is asking you know the mining industry okay how can you how do you think you can help by achieving you know less waste and, and a better uh, circular economy that's something that it's starting to happen, but we really need to, uh, yeah, to still push it because when we need the government and the industry, it's all of the industry in Western Australia. Great, Andy. Did you want to add anything? Yeah, I think they've all been great, great points. Um, maybe just one, one thing to add. I think the future batteries industry, the CRC, um, is a really good exam example of stuff that's um, starting to happen. Uh, again, that's something that sort of sits within a circular economy. You know, it might not be seen as waste or whatever else, but it's it's about creating an economy that tags onto what Mary Lynn was saying that can work long term. I think we really need to remind ourselves on that. And as Hu was saying, with, with regards to the finances and in different um, departments and areas of uh, responsibility, you know, we've got to rethink pretty much how we do a lot of things. That's that's really where we're, where we're at. And policy is one of those things that needs to change to support to support um, a lot of these actions and drive the right type of behaviors. Um, and it needs to be agile. It needs to, you know, provide enough structure, but be flexible enough to sort of move and develop 
um, because you know this a lot of this stuff sort of unprecedented for us. The change, you know, the ideas have been around for a long time, but actually rolling it out um, is going to take you know it's going to take a concerted effort by people across across the board. And, and, and also, if I can add as well, you know, like initiatives like the uh, container deposit schemes, that's an amazing initiative. That's great. And, and you know, other states are doing it in Australia. It's only the beginning um, because it's a great it's a great initiative to to sort and, and collect some of this uh, plastic waste. But if it's to end up sending it abroad anyway, uh, once again, like, why are we doing this? If we are if we are collecting all this uh, clean and, and valuable PET, HDPE plastic to just send it in containers abroad, there is no point. Like we can just send the, the whole container all mixed, it doesn't really matter. If it's to put it in our roads as well, well, yeah, okay, great stuff. We've, we've, it's a great initiative in the sense that uh, we have achieved to put less into our landfills, but this is an, an amazingly valuable resource that we put in public benches and, and roads. Um, and it's better than to put them in the roads than to put them in landfills, but it's still not good enough. It's the first step. We need to go a step forward. Yeah, maybe, um, does anyone want to make any comments on, you know, the, our local manufacturing capability? Do we think, you know, even off the back of um, the COVID pandemic, do you think we'll see an increase in more local manufacturing? You know, whether it's with virgin or recycled uh, materials? I think, my opinion, I think we will and I think we should, we should really uh, support that because um, because we can, because we've got the technology, we've got the skills, like we were, well, I strongly believe that part of the issue that uh, we have in terms of recycling, it's it's a lack of, of, um, of skills and experience and, and yeah, in, in the plastic uh, issue, I think a, a lot of the companies don't have the polymer uh, expertise that they should, but but it's there. Like it's possible to to and otherwise, if we don't have it, let's bring it bring it in. Like it's better to bring in the the science than to export the product. So we can really develop here a and, and, and manufacturing industry. That's that's oh. economically viable. Like I really don't believe I. I I think it's it's always a big argument, but I don't believe when people tell me there isn't a market here and it's not economically viable. I'm, I'm started, I started this organization because, you know, I want to save the world, but hey, listen, I have to live as well. I, I am convinced that there is a huge um, potential. There is like, I'm expecting my company to, to make millions in the next few years because, because it's there, like it, it really has, like I'm, I'm doing this for, for, for the environment, but I'm doing this also for the money, to be honest, because it will be there. So if you've got the skills, you've got the technology, the, the technology that we are um, uh, we are planning to implement here in Western Australia has been used in Europe for over 10 years already. So it's, and, and it's working. It's, it's, we can demonstrate that it's working there. If it's working there, why can it not work in Western Australia? Yeah. If, if I could add to that. I hope you do make millions, by the way, Mary Lynn. Um, we're, we're still trying, <laughs> 12 years in. Um, but uh, I think manufacturing has to come, or not doesn't has to come, but people will be looking at it much more, uh, I guess, much stronger than they have been in the past because things have been so readily available in the just-in-time economy. But as COVID showed us that our supply chains aren't nearly as robust as we once thought. Um, we had CSPB come and um, sort of chat to us about sourcing, uh, I guess, key technical nutrients for their fertilizer, which we've identified we can get out of batteries. Um, you know, they're, they're, they had their supply chain disrupted because they weren't able to get specific materials out of China where they got it from during coronavirus. And I feel like there's a lot of industries that that actually affects. And we realize that we don't have um, like backup stock just sitting around. Everything's just in time. And to have a just in time economy, you need a robust supply chain. And that's probably what's going to drive local manufacturing. I just hope that there's enough demand 
here in WA for people to actually make that leap because it, you'll have to go through a, a lot of pain to bring manufacturing into WA because it's not easy and you need the economies of scale to make it stack up, um, which is why we need policy to change, which sort of makes the economic arguments um, stack up so people can actually come in and set up their manufacturing in WA. Um, you know, the future battery initiative is something that uh, they're looking at from a geopolitical risk perspective because if suddenly China says, yeah, you know, we're not going to give you uh, the materials you need or we're not going to give you the chips that you need unless they're coming in Chinese products. Um, it sort of creates a bit of a geopolitical uh, issue for Australia. And uh, yeah, it's, it's, I don't have all the answers on that because I think globalization, some aspects of it are actually quite circular. There's no point duplicating effort and duplicating uh, capital resources when you don't need to. But there are certainly, uh, there's certainly a need, I feel, to shift that balance back to a bit more local whilst keeping some key things global. Um, so yeah, I feel like it's really, it's the it's going to be 2020 has been so interesting and and stressful to say the least um i feel like that's going to set the tone for the next 10 years on on the change that our country and every country is going to go through so it's probably it's a good time to transition to a circular economy because the economy is changing anyway yeah, yeah i think it's yeah i i agree and i think you know i think in in, in many ways, and, and, and please, please don't take this the wrong way. If, if you've been affected negatively by COVID at all, I, my next comment is not intended to offend you. Um, I think in some ways COVID has been quite a blessing um, because climate change is a very slow moving beast. And so, you know, it's enabled us, many, many of us as in, human race to sit on our hands and not not really take proactive strong um, and fast enough action um, you know a virus moves pretty quickly um, and so our response had to be short sharp clear and definitive um, we now know that our governments are capable of doing that even though they may say that they're not um, they have the capacity, you know, I mean, within a week, we grounded the global aviation fleet. I mean, who would have thought that was possible mm. ever? Um, you know, I mean, we are capable of doing what we need to do to transition. Um, and we just really need to make the most, I think, of the COVID experience, which is, you know, don't, don't wait around. We don't need to, um, you know, slow down and sit on our hands again. We really need to take the lessons from this experience and and move definitively. Um, and I think, you know, the manufacturing industry, you know, um, yeah, it, it's clear to me that we do need our own, our you know, we do need to reignite our, our local manufacturing capacity. And I think government really needs to take the leadership here in terms of, you know, I mean, government procurement is enormous. What if government procurement was to, you know, like, um, you know, government procurement looked at recycled products, you're immediately creating this pull through this, this need, this, this uptake of, of, you know, or everything that we're recycling in inverted commas. So until we really have that push through, um, you know, is there any benefit in, in recycling better? Because that's ultimately not what the circular economy is. It's not just recycling better. It's like we actually need to value these products and materials and keep them at their highest and best use. So, you know, reuse and manufacturing, if you go back to the, the butterfly diagram, you know, the, the closer in, the more circular you are, the further out, the less circular you are. And recycling is way out here. So I think that, you know, part of our understanding and, and sort of iterative education process, not only of the community, but of our government, of our industries, you know, we really need to understand that 
that um, better. Um, but I certainly think that that manufacturing has an important role to play. Yeah. Great. Thanks. I'll just um, turn now to some of the um, questions from the audience and just bring in some of the themes, which is sort of aligning with the conversation. So um, just um, one here from Hayley Rolf, just talking about um, positives from government, um, particularly on sort of um, collaboration between government departments. And I think that ties in um, nicely with procurement as well, which I'd like to bring up. Um, so Hayley says, um, just scroll back up here. So just in terms of um, with the waste strategy to 2030 was released by the waste authority, they sought commitments from other government agencies on how um, they would implement the strategy within the sphere of their influence. Um, so the water corporation, as an example, wrote to their contractors about waste management and procurement and requested feedback on waste streams and recycling. So um, that's a really good thing. And I think that's definitely a role policy and government can play um, in terms of taking the lead and, um, and then in procurement as well, um, some questions, particularly if there's a big focus, I guess, on plastics. And we've talked about um, what um, products we're producing or we can produce um, with recycled content. Um, and also um, some of the audience just make comments on the volatility of, of oil prices and how that affects things. Um, we've recently seen a, a big dip in oil prices and how that's, that's making it difficult, um, the economics of using recycled material. But there's also been some comments around um, what role policy can play in terms of sort of the social responsibility or corporate social responsibility of, you know, manufacturers to produce um, products with recycled material and make that known um, to people that are buying content. So does any of the panellists sort of want to make comments on that? Um, maybe Mary Lynn around, around plastics in terms of, you know, if you're going to sell products as a, a remanufacturer, is that something that governments are going to be looking for? Um, you know, to, to buy a product that, that you can truly say or somehow certify um, and say that, you know, this is made from, you know, reprocessed plastic here in WA? Yeah, and I think uh, one of the, uh, yeah, one of the points that you're raising here also, I think it's, it's transparency and it's very quite uh, important in a time like today. Um, just this morning, I actually shared on, on LinkedIn a, a news article that um, said that um, in China in the last uh, couple of months with the COVID-19 uh, crisis and the, the crash of the oil price, they've actually uh, put some virgin material in plastics, selling it as recycled plastics. Mm. Um, and that's something that, you know, that is something that if we do it in the country, onshore, this is something that we have the traceability. Um, and and, and um, you can hear that I am not Australian from my accent, but uh, when I arrived here, I was actually in Australia, I was actually quite uh, struck with the fact that people are very proud here to buy product that are made in Australia. We've got this all, you know, made in, made in Australia, green and yellow uh, kangaroo thing. It's, it's very important to tap into this because, um, because it means that we are ready for it. We are like, people are generally really interested in knowing where their goods are coming from. Um, by sending the material abroad, then we can't trace this anymore. Uh, by keeping it, then you're, you're proud to actually say, well, you know what, my, so and a really good example is this uh, sunglasses or glasses uh, company um, that is doing uh, glasses from recycled plastics. They are able to actually tell you exactly where that plastic comes from. So you have a pair of sunglasses on your head that you know exactly that, you know, it was from a fishing net that just washed off, uh, you know, the, on the coast of, of of Australia and that you've saved that from, from the environment uh, in a product that is not meant to be used once and, and, and thrown away again. Um, there, there is a huge push from, from the community and, and people. They, they actually, they are ready to do it. We just need to give them the opportunity. Yeah, great. I know um, even things I've seen in other states, like in Victoria, and I know we've got some people on the call um, from across Australia, but seeing, you know, good, great leadership from governments in terms of um, procurement and, you know, hosting um, big sort of buy recycled um, events and conferences and, and really focusing on large infrastructure projects. And, and not just, I know we've seen the sort of, you know, plastic bags, you know, replace and making, you know, quite sort of novel items like park benches and that, but really at scale, you know, things like, you know, railway sleepers and other products um, that we can, can make lo locally 
Um, and, and make sure that whatever product you can do is is going to follow these principles of circular economy, which means they are not going to generate more waste and they are recyclable again at the end of their life cycle. So ideally that life cycle has to be long and at the end of it, you can recycle it again. And, and, um, and that's something that we are not really uh, good still at, at doing because um, yeah, we can recycle plastic, but if it's to mix it with something else, it's going to be really difficult to recycle it again. And the, the, yeah, the circular economy and, and you know all about it and I'm sure you're going to talk about it, but it's all in, into the design. Like we really need to look at the designs more than just the quantity of, of things that we, uh, we recycle. Yeah, we had a, just while I was you, Marilyn, we had a, a technical question come through. I'm just scrolling through the chat to see if I can find it from Libby Boyd. Um, and it was, I think it's a plastics um, recycling technology, but Libby says, could members of the panel comment on the work of Thomas um, Mashmeyer from Sydney Uni on um, CAT HTR technology and how this might become useful in remanufacturing, um, particularly how expensive it is. Are you familiar with that technology, Mary Lynn? I, know. I am not myself, so I would have liked Ben to be on the call, but he couldn't. Um, is it if we are talking about um, if we are talking about uh, taking plastic into the forms of oil, transforming it into oil again? Um, it's a really good technology, but we don't have the infrastructures in Australia to then return it into a plastic a polymer again, which means that it ends up being a really expensive. It's a really expensive technology uh, for not much gain. So economic, it's not economical to, to, to run it here in Australia because we don't have the infrastructure for it. Um, so the, yeah, of course, I would rather go towards a technology that uh, the technology we are planning to implement here is, is more about the recompound of the, uh, of the polymer, but without turning it into oil. Because once you have it into oil, you have to re transform it again into polymer. So you're just adding more steps and more cost um, to the process. Right. So if, if this is what we are talking about, then uh, yes. <laughs> yeah, Libby, if you're interested in, in finding out any more, maybe just reach out to Marilyn directly and she can put you in touch with, um, with Ben, their, their polymer engineer at Keto. Yeah. I just, I'd now like to shift the conversation to uh, maybe talking about household waste management and, and different sort of streams. Um, that relate to policy. So David Carr asked um, at the beginning of the session, um, a question actually directed at you, um, Hoya, was what is the possibility of introducing a residential six bin program in the Perth metro area? So I know we're seeing that um, in other states where we're adding another bin around glass. It's a quite um, a common problem, the contamination of waste um, that's coming out of the household. Do you have any thoughts on that? Do you think we'll see that in WA in the future? Um, maybe not six bins, but maybe more more bins or, you know, do you have any comments on, you know, the legislation of, of household waste management and, and what we're doing well, what we could do better? Yes and no. Um, uh, yes, that's, that's a bit of a complex one. David, thanks for the question. Um, yes, we could have six bins. We could also have 42 bins like Japan. We could have central recycling depots where they have 42 bins and you literally, there is no waste in households. It's absolutely phenomenal. Um, however, I don't think we have the cultural capacity um, to deal with 42 bins. I don't think we're as well, I don't think we're as culturally well trained as the Japanese to um, separate and to take on that, that community responsibility. Um, in terms of six bins, look, we are um, still struggling with three, to be honest. Um, so six bins feels like a stretch to me. Um, there's so many different levels of where there are challenges and issues that need to be um, ironed out. So um, in terms of 
uh, the three bin system, for example, we have a number of local councils who have wholeheartedly um, leapt in with both feet. They've done the research. They've really engaged their communities. Um, they're, they're, you know, they've invested in behaviour change and education. Um, they've worked through the process, worked through the challenges as they have arisen. Um, and they now are rolling out their, their, their FOGO bin, their third bin, their uh, food, and, uh, food organics and garden organics bin. Um, they have internal capacity to continue to work through any problems that come up. Um, they've invested really um, a lot of time and energy into understanding um, what, what goes into the bin and once they have the contents of the bin, where it can go and then how that can be on sold. Um, so, it, you know, it's a great example of, um, of circular inaction. Um, that's a small fraction of the councils. Um, other councils are... Um, at, at the bottom end of that scale are uh, nowhere near that and they're signing contracts for their food and, and um, food and garden organics to go to Quinana um, uh, into energy for uh, energy for um, waste for energy facilities um, which in my opinion is going the wrong way down the waste hierarchy we need to be going up towards a void not down towards landfill and um, energy to waste um, is is one step back up from landfill. So I'm not a, not a huge fan. Knowing also that Europe, who invested a lot in in those facilities, are are now pulling investment out and shutting them down. Um, so I I don't think that's a that's a um, a useful step in terms of getting more circular. Um, yep. However, that's what Western Australia is doing at the moment. Um, so I think we have a lot of issues still to iron out in terms of community education and behaviour change about what is going into the bin and how it needs to go in, lids or no lids, clean or not clean, et cetera, et cetera, um, as well as creating, ultimately creating markets for all of those products. I mean, why why go to the trouble of separating things out further if we don't have markets to facilitate um, the, the use of those products? So six bin, sorry, have I answered your question? Six bin feels scary and like we're a long way away from that because we're still dealing with adding one extra bin and all of the, the, the issues that have come from that. Yeah. Yeah, are there are any, I guess... <laughs> Propose it to other panelists. Are there any other sort of policy levers we could pull, or things we could change to improve, I guess, the circularity of resources? You know, considering the home. I can just interject that. I think just um, I was going to sort of mention getting the avoid side of things. I think I raised this um, innovation Australia. I think the same question came up about the bins. It's like, can we avoid actually creating that many waste streams in in the first place? You know, what what can be done um, to limit the products that are coming through, how do we work with supermarkets, supply chains, you know, there's examples elsewhere of reusable um, systems, supermarkets that don't have any packaging, it all comes in, in different containers. Again, this is about a rethink that goes into the, the previous points. So, you know, really the, the focus on in the circular economy, a lot of where the interest is growing is in that design side of things. And I think there's a lot of people here that are coming from that sort of design engineering space. Um, that sort of ties into a point I was going to make to the previous question about manufacturing and the benefits of the circular economy. You know, having done some work with James and his brother Michael at, at Total Green, you know, they've started out recycling, but they're seeing there's real benefit to be made in um, looking at reuse models. So again, um, and you know, Michael is looking at micro factories, other things that can be done. So it's not just about uh, economies of scale. There can be things where um, small businesses can start up. We've got technologies now, we've got enablers that allow things to be done locally, you know, with um, additive manufacturing, you know, we can do it plastics, metals, all sorts of things can be done in a different way. So it's not economies of scale that we've got to push stuff out onto people. It can be, it can be pool systems. The companies like, you know, Toyota have been trying to do with their lean manufacturing for, for, for years. You know, we can do similar things on a smaller scale. 
And I think, as James said, the big the big players aren't going to just disappear, but they need to start working with the smaller players. And that ties into, you know, one of the things with the circular economy is like take uh, design biomimicry is sort of learn from nature. You know, in nature, big and small trees in a forest exist together. If all the small trees end up dying, then, you know, often that, that far, forest uh, ends up dying in itself. So we've got to get to that point where the big guys aren't, killing off the smaller players and find ways whereby you know we can do things as many things as we can locally and obviously we, for certain things there will be a, a need for economies of scale and we've got to sort of stay with that so um yeah it's, there's real benefits there and this is one of the things i see people posting up stuff on the circular economy for policy there's papers there there's real benefits um this isn't just starting out blindly we're we're behind people here and there's a lot of uh, information out there from different countries of things that can be followed over East. You know, we should be getting on, on with this, this stuff, the, the 2030 um, um, strategy um, is really, is really, really great. We've got to implement it. And that's the hardest thing. It's like, it's like with innovation, it's all well and good coming up with the designs, but turning that into something that works, you know, that creates value is the hardest part. So that's, I think, what policy needs to do. It really needs to help people like Mary Lynn get off the ground. Um, people like James and, and Total Green to be able to do their business and plan forward and, uh, and really, you know, carry on to do the work that they're doing without all the, the headaches of not knowing what's around the corner, you know? And I think this is really, really what we need to sort of see happen. So sorry for going on across the board, but um, there's a few sort of points that sort of tied in, so. Um, if I could, I'd also like to add, uh, if we don't go to a six bin system, possibly four bins where we add a battery bin. Um, because if we're talking about creating or avoiding waste, how much waste is a fire that burns down infrastructure? Um, and when you turn that into economic cost, how expensive is it to roll out a battery bin to every household um, in comparative in comparison to the hundreds of fires that occur in waste management every year, yeah, you know, how much money is that wasting? Um, which if we just changed our behavior slightly, we could save all the resources that get burnt, all the infrastructure that disappears and all the erosion of public trust in recycling infrastructure. Um, I think that's something definitely worth considering, but that's my own point that I'm pushing to get batteries out of the waste management stream or the, or the, the waste stream altogether, the waste and recycling stream, because um, they're creating havoc throughout the industry, not just in Australia, but globally. And um, there are solutions to actually fix these problems, but it's a great example of um, product stewardship or the, the true cost of not managing a waste stream correctly there's a real short time frame which you can look on, which you add up all the cost of all the waste fires across uh, the globe. Um, it's quite a sum of money. And with that sum of money, if we could avoid that from occurring, um, what sort of infrastructure and change we could actually make happen would be quite remarkable, in my opinion. That's my little tidbit to add. I agree. Um, I've got a um, a pretty radical concept which um, would ultimately uh, put me out of a job, which would be fantastic. Um, the Dutch, and I've literally just come across this yesterday, so excuse me if my understanding is not complete here, but the Dutch are moving away from defining, from waste being the definition of their, sorry, what are the words? Here, we, uh, waste and its definition is a lot to do with what we're seeing in this waste reform paper. What is waste? What class is it? Which landfill should it go in, et cetera, et cetera. The Dutch are moving away from defining waste like that. So essentially everything is understood to be a resource that can be reused. And the hard work, um, if you want to throw away something, 
and ultimately not 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 reuse it. The hard work is in defining an item as a as a waste. So it's completely flipped our system on its head, which I think is fantastic. And you know the complete paradigm shift that we need. Really, um, you know, it'll be great if we didn't if we didn't have the waste strategy twenty thirty, and it was the resource strategy twenty thirty. You know, so we're actually starting to speak differently you know the stories that we're telling and the way that we communicate is not about this thing called waste you know waste waste doesn't exist in nature so you know feeding into andy's point about you know biomimicry creating you know nature doesn't have waste products they feed the next system so our systems need to remove conceptually remove waste as an idea and look at how we continually feed other systems. So yes, I wouldn't have a job, but I could go and do something else. No, I definitely think that's a big point. I mean, it's even one of the questions I'd, I'd wrote down in the lead up to the event was around, um, yeah, the language we use, particularly in policy. And, and I think that that really relates to the paradigm shift of, of, you know, how does the current system work and how does the system that, how can the system work in the future and what do we need to change? And I think maybe on that point, I'll just add, quickly add something to that um, because within the circular economy through all the training they made a point don't talk about sustainability because it's been and gone and even though a lot of the circular economy is built upon that it's 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 sort of become old hat that's gone in the wrong direction and being misused so it's very much about bringing that positive uh, spin on onto things and rather than it being about compliance the circular economy has taken the, the sort of the, the positive approach about recreating the future, think, rethinking the future. Um, and as, as the points have just been made about the language, it's really important. And a lot of the stuff that they're talking about are close uh, loops, keeping them closer to the user, as I've just put up there, you know, um, from other schools of thought, food, food, um, waste equals food was one of the um, sort of things that they were sort of using. But language is really important in the circular economy. Um, and I think it's it's something that needs to be included within policy and built in there and start to be used by people who are talking about this stuff as well. Um, so I just wanted to add that, but um, it's, it's quite interesting when you're in this sort of space, places like the Alan MacArthur Foundation, they very, very rarely talk about sustainability and things like that. It's very much sort of trying to put a positive spin. So. Great. We'll, we'll keep going through. We've got to, uh, I'll just add another question into the mix so we can keep going. We'll, we'll keep going through till 12.30. I think that's when we'd planned. Um, Jenny had a question here just um, focusing on FOGO, so um, food organics and garden organics, and asks um, why this is not adopted more generally by councils. Um, is it a cost issue or a lack of infrastructure or, or is it another problem? Um, great question, Jenny. And I think it's all of those things. Um, yeah, I think it's, I think it's all of those things really. Um, yeah, as I mentioned before, there are some proactive councils who have really gone out and done the work around, um, understanding how, how, how to make it happen. And when the challenges have, have arisen, they've been able to respond to them. Um, there are other councils who, um, really, uh, have lacked the capacity to do that. Um, and have seen it as a challenge that they're unable to overcome, I think. Um, some of it is about existing contracts. Um, you know, there are existing contracts in place for, um, yeah, um, for energy from waste facilities. Um, I, I, would, I would say watch this space, particularly on those councils who have those existing contracts in place because it is essentially going against what the state want. Um, so that, that will be an issue that the state and, and councils need to um, probably go head to head on at some point, I would have thought. Um, there have been some early adopters, which has been amazing. Um, the city of Melville, super impressed they've won awards they've done really well they continue to do really well I, I talk with them on a regular basis um, they've they're at the forefront of understanding how to bring fogo into um, into multi-res apartments which is tricky um, uh, 
uh, Frio um, also are doing their bit, which has been great. So the early adopters has been has been good. We now need to see the next wave of councils start to adopt FOGO. Um, and then we will see the stragglers who will ultimately get forced over the deadline, um, you know, in, in a number of years. Um, yeah. So, yes, it's all of those things. It, it's a combination of all of those things that you mentioned and, um, yeah, unique to, to, to every council and, and the specific challenges that they're facing. Um, one of the things that I've been doing with NCycle um, is actually having conversations with these councils and saying, um, look, you know, how, how much capacity do you actually have to respond to what is required of you going forward? You know, like this is the strategy, this is now what, what, what the expectation is. Do you have the capacity to respond? Um, little plug for NCycle. If you don't, you could hire us to help you. Um, some councils have been interested and, and some aren't. So I, I'm, I won't be surprised if there are some councils that get dragged kicking and screaming over the line. Mm -hmm. Is it, is it an issue as well of like the quality of the product? So if we're making with Fogo, right, we're making, um, you know, fertilizer for farming or we're making, um, you know, mulch for houses or whatever, like, I mean, tying that back into the issue of procurement, you know, cause it is a big change, you know, we need to still be selling that product, right. To make the economic stack up back to farmers or back to households. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, and essentially, you know, if, if councils are responsible for collecting and then, um, you know, industrially composting, so, you know, putting, putting food organics through um, a stringent um, process so that what comes out the other end meets all of the, you know, the, the required safety measures and, and, and guidelines, um, you know, currently there's very limited infrastructure um, to do that, you know, for councils. So they are receiving this great resource. Um, they may not have any way of, of composting it without, you know, going out and making additional, additional relationships with, with other providers or in essence, working out how to manage that technology themselves. So that's a whole nother part of the, the sort of environmental regulation and licensing of new facilities coming online. Um, and then ultimately, do we have a market for it? You know, are, are we actually, you know, like are, are councils now saying, right, this is, this is the product that we use in all of, you know, in all of the business that we do. Um, you know, this is the proportion that we can use. This is the proportion that we need to sell to make this a circular, um, you know, uh, outcome. Uh, so there, there's a lot of work to be done. You know, I mean, we, we now have the state direction saying that's the way that we're going and councils are struggling. Many of them are struggling to respond to that in a meaningful way. So, um, you know, they've got, a, they've got a bit of time, but their time is, is running out really quickly. Um, and I think that, yeah, I mean, the, the regional councils, you know, the, the EMRC and the MRC, um, uh, are, are doing a lot of good work. But I think that, yeah, as I said, there are going to be some, some councils that struggle to get over the line. Cool. I think um, just that in here. So Mark um, makes an interesting comment on, we were talking before about the use of language and he says um, resources instead of waste is a question mark, but resources um, can also be seen as a dirty word and um, refer to um, our mining industry, oil and, oil and gas and iron ore and whatnot. So um, excellent point. Excellent point. Of the language. Excellent we, point. Yeah. You know, and, and, you know, so I think, I mean, Mark, that's, that's brilliant. And I think that we need to start to, to, to unpack that for our own state. You know, I mean, I, I have been, you know, an environmental practitioner for over 20 years. Um, I've been telling the story of environmental protection for 20 years. That's effectively um, a pointless story to tell. You know, like, we're not going to continue to turn more people onto the environmental protection agenda. We need to be talking to the economics of it now. So the circular economy for me has been that opportunity to really examine, um, you know, deep within myself, if we want to get philosophical and, and look, at, look at the stories that I've been telling and how impactful they have been. And for the most part, I'm sad to say, that's been 20 wasted years of telling a story that 
um, you know, me and my friends might agree with, but the people that I really need to influence are not interested in listening to, and it's not meaningful for them. Yeah. So I think you make an excellent point about that. Resources, that word, may not work in Western Australia. Yeah. We, need find, we need to find a word. We need to find a story that does work. Yeah, Andy's just commented there just around and how the um, we mentioned the butterfly diagram, which is a sort of systems overview diagram for the circular economy from the Ellen MacArthur Foundation and around nutrients, you know, looking at biological cycles and, and technical cycles and, and differentiating between the two. And really, I guess that's what FOGO is, is how are we managing the biological, you know, flow of nutrients in WA. I mean, I know beyond um, household waste management, there's great examples in business, you know, I've read stuff about, um, we mentioned Water Corporation before from a question around, you know, um, other things we can do instead of fertilising, you know, biogases, um, that sort of thing. And, and, you know, there's great, there's a company here in Canning Vale, I think Rich Grow, that makes products and sells them in Bunnings. And they've, they've got their own sort of in feed of, of um, you know, organic materials that they're recycling. So definitely, definitely doable. Um, if we if we take a systems approach uh, we've probably got time for um we might actually we've got five more minutes so i might um just sort of go to each panelist and just maybe have some closing remarks um it's been a really good robust discussion um maybe just some remarks from your own perspective um what you'd like to see um policy moving forward maybe one thing we didn't really get to and, and we touched on it early on was um the need for dedicated circular economy policy um, that is removed from, you know, just being stuck in this waste management or this environmental, stuck with an environmental agency. Um, I know that's something, um, I think the Victorian state government has recently released a circular economy policy. Um, is that something we want to see in WA? Will we see that in the coming years? Um, yeah, any sort of closing remarks from the panellists? Um, maybe Mary Lynn, I'll start with you. Yep, yeah, sorry. Um, yeah, definitely. I think I think we do need policies around circular economy rather than waste. Again, uh, just uh, waste management because it's just um, the first step, but it's not enough. Um, and I think there there is one thing also. It's that. Um, we need policies and we need to enforce the, the policies, but what we need also, I think, if we want to achieve circular economy, it's incentives. So it will actually create the opportunity and the market by itself instead of having a government that has to rule. Um, so incentives for in my case, I'm talking just about my industry, I guess, but uh, incentive for using recycled plastic, incentive for the purchase, for the for the government um, uh, supply and, and all these kind of things um, would be a great thing, additionally to the, uh, to the policies, I guess. Oh, we can't hear you. We can't hear you, Dylan. <laughs> Sorry, thanks. Um, I'll hand it over to you, James. Thanks, Marilyn. Um, yeah, I guess my key message is is we can't really recycle our way out of this problem. Uh, it's just killing the planet slower than what it already is. <laughs> Bit of a negative view. But, um, you know, like, like we need to be doing more good than bad regenerative things rather than just recycling and I'm a recycling company um, so do myself out of a job but you know the amount of things that we see coming through that just doesn't need to be produced in the first place is probably the best place to start how you do that from a policy level I think we've got a tremendous challenge uh, ahead of us to get practical solutions that actually work there. But um, yeah, it's like I said at the start, it's very exciting because there's a lot of opportunity um, to be had in this space. And um, we can be the people that make that change over the next 10, 20 years. So uh, we just gotta be, uh, I guess, take a bit of an iterative approach you can't really systemically change design through iterative approaches, but um, we just need to be checking, measuring, seeing how we're going and get it out of the theoretical space into the practical space and actually start getting some home runs, actually start you know, doing things here from cradle to cradle rather than just do a small part of the process and then 
say we're on our way, you know, like we've got to actually hit that hit that home run. So we got real proof of concept. So well, here's a real circular product. How can we make more of these and consume less of these non-circular things? Yeah, great. Thanks, James. Uh, Hoya? James, how about 10 years, not 20? <laughs> <laughs> Let's do it in 10 <laughs> or five. Um, Oh look, I'm yeah. Look, I'm I'm super excited about this space. I'm I I go between being super excited and really really exhausted. Um, hopefully, that there's a happy medium somewhere in the middle. Um, look, everyone, government. I, I, my my personal opinion, government policy is really essential. What what we're looking for is guidance. We're not looking for heavy duty regulation and direction. Government is a government is a key stakeholder here, but they are in partnership with every other stakeholder on this journey. Um, government don't have all the answers. In fact, government and if you're listening, Dwer, you do fantastic work, don't get me wrong, but um, Dwer probably have less capacity than everybody on this Zoom chat right at the moment. Mm. So um, they are, as I said, they're one of the key stake stakeholders. They are not the only one, but we need clear direction from government and we need clear support. And then government need to stand alongside us as in you know industry and all the rest of us move forward incentives absolutely essential government need to do their part by you know around procurement around investing in in circular industries around really signaling strongly and clearly to the market that this is where we're going um, and you know it's already been done out there as many of you have, have suggested the Netherlands have got a fantastic policy which I you know is my bedtime reading at least once a week um, you know there's lots of good stuff so we're not doing it from scratch we do need to make it unique to our state and make it work for us but we can totally get there so um, I'll see you all at the pub in 10 years when we're fully circular yeah, great. I love the love the enthusiasm and positivity. Uh, Andy, um, over to you for closing remarks. Yeah, so one thing is we need to sort of promote collaboration. Sometimes a lot of the policy that's put in place and the funding and everything else pits one another against one another. And we've sort of got to know people in this sort of space through having those conversations. Um, and I think that's really important is finding ways to help one another get going and um, and develop things further. Um, and one thing that might be worth looking at that we're trying to kick off is a, some sort of innovation, circular economy innovation network to allow us to have these sort of conversations with some of the decision makers um, to, to have a broader conversation across these disciplines. There isn't just, um, you know, with people running their, their businesses or whatever else it is with key decision makers. And we get um, some sort of, circular economy formal sort of network going whereby we can have people coming together discussing things levels of expertise um whatever it may be um to sort of facilitate the and speed up the transition i think that's one of the key things again from the circular economy is that the speed of transition which here i was sort of brought up we need to shift asap so that's my closing remarks great Thanks, Annie. And just a, a big sort of virtual round of applause um, from everyone that's still here to all our panellists. Thanks for joining us. Um, it's been a really good discussion. I've enjoyed it. Um, so yeah, thank you, Huia. Thank you, Mary Lynn. Thank you, James. Thank you, Andy. Um, we've run slightly over time, so I'd like to just wrap up sharply here. So um, we'll be announcing our next event, um, which will be in approximately four weeks time. And hopefully we can have that back in the city. Um, we're just waiting to check a few things um, and meeting will be great to meet back in person. And um, resume with our um, putting on beer and wine and, and food and um, catching up with everyone again um, face to face um, and really getting the working going. I think that's what I miss most out of our um, face to face meetups, seeing all the ideas and, and just catching up and seeing um, just how everyone's going, um, particularly through this time. So um, keep an eye out on our meetup page and on our mailing list, um, and we will be posting this recording out, out on our YouTube channel if you'd like to share. Um, with anyone or if anyone's missed it today. So thanks again. Um, we'll end it there and we'll see you next time uh, with Circular Economy Perth.